try to be with your sense of the body right here. Try to see how long you can stay there. You can use both the felt sense of the breath energy in the body, and you can also use pictures in the mind, pictures of your body. If you want to focus on the breath, think of a picture of how the breath flows. You remind yourself it can flow in a lot of ways that you might not expect. So it gives you something to be interested in the present moment, to be interested in the body. Or you can focus on the different parts of the body. Hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, all the way down to the list. And just in a very objective way, ask yourself, where are those different parts of the body right now? The body is such a huge issue in our lives. The reason we have to work is because the body needs to be fed, needs to be clothed, sheltered, needs medicine. And the slightest little thing that happens in the body, all the alarm systems go off. A huge part of your brain is devoted to keeping track of how things feel in the body, especially in the digestive tract, but in other parts as well. And it's a big concern. But you want to learn how to look at it so it's not such a big concern, so it doesn't take up so much of your, of your mind. So the question is, how to use it skillfully and when to put it down. Putting it down means just putting it aside and not focusing so much on it. We focus on the body to get the mind to settle down. And we can focus on different aspects of the body to ask ourselves, why are we so attached to it? So it plays a double role. On the one hand, it is our place of refuge. So the mind isn't running out all over the place. But at the same time, the body itself is a problem, or our attitudes toward the body are a problem. That's what you've got to learn how to set, sort out. To remind yourself there's a healthy use of the body and there's an unhealthy use of the body. The unhealthy use is what gives rise to greed, aversion, and delusion. Pride around the body. Lust around the body. These things create huge problems for the mind. Of course, it's the mind that's creating the problems. If it hadn't latched on here, the body would be totally a matter of indifference. But at the same time, you need the body in order to practice. You need the body in order to do good things. So focus on the good side of the body the healthy attitude you can have toward the body. One of the important uses the Buddha talks about is restraint of the senses. He says our senses are normally like animals. And they go out. It's not the case that we're just sitting here waiting for contact to come. We're out there looking for something to feed on, something to get angry about, something to get lustful about, something to get greedy about. The mind is a real troublemaker, trouble seeker. And each of the senses is like an animal. And the animals are, in the Buddhist image, are tied to leashes, and you try to tie the leashes together. But if it's just the leashes on their own, then whichever animal is strongest is going to pull the other ones in its path. In his image, you've got a bird, you've got an alligator, you've got a monkey, you've got a dog, you've got a hyena. And of course, of those, which is the strongest is the alligator. It's going to drag all the other animals down into the river, and they're all going to die. In other words, your goodness dies as you go out after something based on greed, aversion, delusion, lust, resentment, whatever. You need a post so you can tie all the leashes to the post. And that's what the body's good for. It can either be just being aware of the breath here in the present moment, 
so that when the thoughts go out, you notice they're going out. This is a theme you hear in the Forest of Giants a lot. There's a current that flows out of the mind. And it's the current that causes all the trouble. It goes out your eyes, your ears, nose, tongue, body. And so if you've got the sense of the breath right here, that helps you to see. Okay, You can stay here and the thought will go shooting out, but you don't go shooting out with it. You can see it as something separate. Now that requires that the mind be really still and inclined not to want to go running out. So it involves not only concentration, but also some discernment, reminding yourself of that. It's this tendency of the mind to go out and look for trouble. That's what's causing all the trouble. So you have to think about that until you have a sense of dispassion toward it. And the breath helps with that in not only giving you a place to stay, but also a comfortable place to stay, so you're not so hungry for whatever little hit of pleasure you might get out of an attractive sight or appealing sound. You've got something better right here. So it makes those other things a little less attractive, a little less appealing, a little less compelling. And you can begin to see the processes. In other words, instead of being so concerned about the actual object of what you're looking at or listening to, you can ask yourself, why is the mind going for it? And in John Lee's way of looking at things, what's, what's doing the looking, what's doing the listening? Is it your discernment? Is it your lust? You've got to sort these things out. And then you can also look at the other end. When, once you've gotten engaged with that particular sight, sound, smell, taste, tactile sensation, what effect does it have on the mind? In other words, you're looking at this as part of a causal process. It's not just the thing there with its, what, or we interpret as being its innate characteristics of being likable or unlikable. Instead, it's part of a process. The mind goes out, picks up an object, brings it back home clutters up the house. Okay, that's something you've got to learn how not to do. It's one of the big ironies of people who meditate and focus entirely on just what they do when they sit with their eyes closed or do a little walking meditation. And then they abandon it totally as they go out into the world and continue engaging in the world in their, with their old ways. Once the mind is settled down, you want to protect it. And the big destroyer of your concentration, the big destroyer of your mindfulness, is this tendency to want to go feeding off sights, sounds, and smells, taste, tactile sensations, the way you have been in the past, and bringing things back to clutter up this home of the mind. So watch out for that. Try to use the breath as your anchor. You can also use your contemplation of the body as an anchor. After you've analyzed your body and looked at all the different parts, put it out on the floor. Ask yourself which part there are you really attracted to. Then you can start doing the same for other people. They've got the same stuff you've got. This is a great equalizer. And also reminds you, what are you really attracted to? You're attracted to things outside, or you're attracted to your idea of things outside, or what you would like to see outside. Again, it keeps bringing you back to the mind. The mind is the real problem. There's another image for restraint of the senses. There's a big termite nest, and inside the termite nest is a civet cat. The civet cats like to go in there because they can find things to eat inside, usually bugs of various kinds, because it's not just termites and there are all kinds of things going to termite nests. The civet cat goes in there. There are six holes. And in this image, you 
block off five of the holes and you keep your attention right at the one hole, in other words, right at the mind. Because it's not sights that are causing the trouble, and it's not your eye that's causing the trouble, it's not sounds or your ear or any of the senses of their objects, it's the mind's desire to do things with these things. It's a desire to feed off of them. This brings you back, right back to the mind. So you've got to protect it, because if you let it just go wandering around as however it likes in the course of the day, when the time comes to sit down and meditate, it's going to want to keep on wandering. And in the meantime, it's brought off all this stuff to clutter up, clutter up the house. There's no place to sit down. You've just got to spend the whole time just throwing things out, throwing things out, throwing things out. You get it finally clean, and then you leave the meditation, and you drag more garbage into the house again. So if you really are earnest about training your mind, really are earnest about trying to see if there's some way you can lessen its burdens and relieve its suffering, the meditation can't be simply a matter of what you do when you sit when your eyes close or you're doing formal walking meditation. It's how you engage the world through all your senses, through all the day. We often talk about bringing the practice into your life. A much better image is bringing your life into the practice. In other words, make the practice of wanting to train your mind the container. And all the rest of your engagement in the world has to fit within that container. And if it doesn't fit within that container, you don't want it. Because it's just going to create unnecessary trouble and it's going to destroy the container. And then you have to patch it up again. And at the same time, when you learn some restraint over the, the senses as you go through the day, then when you do come to sit down, you're sitting down with some better habits, because it's the same mind. You place some restraint over it, but it's a friendly restraint in the sense that there is that sense of ease that goes with being settled in the body. then the mind will be more likely to want to stay with the breath, realizing that the restraint that is involved in staying with the breath is not an unfriendly restraint. It's interesting when the Buddha talks about restraint, there are two kinds of things, restraint of the senses, and then restraint over your thoughts, words, and deeds, in other words, what you do as you go out toward the world. And it's all motivated by another restraint, the restraint of goodwill. We don't usually think of goodwill as a restraint. Instead, we think of it as this natural outpouring of our innate goodness. But that's not how the Buddha taught it. He said it is a form of restraint. You realize there are certain things you just cannot do if you really want to happiness. And the path enables you to have a sense of well-being as you deny yourself the old ways you had of feeding. It's because you truly want true happiness, and you like that happiness to spread around. You don't want your happiness to have to depend on anyone else's suffering. That's what motivates all this restraint. So it's not simply a matter of just clamping down on yourself which, if it's done in an unskillful way, just leads you to explode. Instead, you gather things in, protect things that are valuable, and watch out for any tendency you may have to be the person who destroys those valuables out of thoughtlessness or the desire for cheap thrills. You want a happiness that lasts. And it's because of that motivation that your restraint can become a healthy thing.